Well, I'm going to talk to you probably this week and next week about a little subject called training for reigning. How many of you believe you're called by God to be a king and a priest in his kingdom? How many of you realize that we're all ministers of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, that we all have a responsibility to be leaders to a degree in the body of Christ? Do you believe that? We have a responsibility to tell others of the good news of Jesus and help disciple and train others. So we're all, if you will, being trained to reign in various capacities. Now, last week, if you remember, if you weren't here, I talked about a young man named David, King David, and his confrontation with the giant Goliath. The title of the message was, Is There Not a Cause? Now, you can go back and watch that if you didn't get a chance to to see it or, or listen to it. But David, at a young age, understood that there were two kingdoms in conflict. You see, the kingdom of darkness comes to steal, kill, and destroy everything that is good, loving, full of God's light and, and perfectness, right? So that includes cancer. God is not the author of cancer, right? And so uh, cancer, sickness, disease, whatever it is, poverty, different assets. These are wars, famines. These are all things because of the, the, the power of darkness. Now, there are some things that are naturally caused that aren't necessarily demonic in nature, and, and that's a whole other discussion. But here's the thing. God's kingdom, the kingdom of light, has come and it's superior in every way. Now, these two kingdoms, until Jesus returns and fully consummates his kingdom that he inaugurated when he was here on earth, there's this confrontation. And so you and I are born into a world in which, whether you're a believer or not, there's, there's these two kingdoms opposed to one another. When you became a Christian, you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That's good news. Because Jesus is the light of the world, now we have become the light of the world. Now, in that role, you have to understand there's these Goliaths out there that taunt us. And they try to stop us. And sometimes, as I shared last week, the Goliath is in our mind. It's not just something that's out there, although there are times there's these spiritual forces we come against in situations. But sometimes it's just our own strongholds in our mind of unbelief. Wrong self-image. When you became a Christian, God gave you a new identity. You have to learn how to live in that new identity. Sometimes we're still living in that old identity and that thing's dead. It's been crucified. And God wants us to live out of the new identity. So there's these two kingdoms opposed to one another. Now David has this great victory. If you will, it's like he defeated cancer that day. Goliath was a cancer. He came against... This giant that was stopping the advancement of God's kingdom. The King Saul didn't recognize it. David's brothers, the other men in the army didn't recognize it. But David, as a teenager, recognized there's a cause. It's the advancement of the kingdom of God. And Jesus, looking to a future day, David was acting like Jesus would would act. Jesus coming and destroying the powers of darkness, coming against the Goliaths that taunt us. And so we've got to recognize there is a fight in us. I'm not talking about where you're fighting with your own soul. I'm talking about you are born into the kingdom of light and there is a holy tenacity by the Spirit of God within you that's leaning you, pushing you to advance God's kingdom and God's purposes in this hour, to stand against injustice. Uh, how many of you like injustice? No, we hate it, right? What We want justice. We're ministers of justice, reconciliation, helping to bridge that gap, helping people be restored to Jesus Christ and to the Father and his great love. Now, Paul said this. I'm warming us up here for training for reigning. Paul said this in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, we are more than conquerors, Paul said, because of what Jesus has done for us. Paul's saying, I no longer live according to my flesh or my old ways. I live by the life of the Son of God that's in me. I died to myself and I'm raised to new life in him. I'm living out of his being, out of his spirit, out of his power, out of his resurrection. You see, when you became born again, you were put on the offensive, not on the defensive. Too much in the church, we're trying to hold on. <laughs> if I can just hold on till Jesus comes. No. Advance. <laughs> Pray against cancer. Well, Pastor, we haven't seen. No, no, we are seeing cancer healed. We're seeing other things healed. We'll see more healed if more will go on the offensive. Christ in you, the hope of glory, resurrection life in you as a believer that eradicates cancer, that stops the injustice and begins to move God's love and mercy into situations that so desperately need it. Whether it's a family situation, marriage in crisis, family, loved one in crisis, whatever it is, job situation, God wants to inv invade and encounter. You, you realize every conversion Plunders hell and populates heaven, right? Every miracle reveals his majesty and glory. Every encounter with God, it leads us into a deeper understanding of the Father's love for us. The Father's not angry at us. He loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news. You're on the offensive. Don't be obnoxious, but be confident. Now, let's talk a little bit more about training for reigning. David has this amazing victory, doesn't he, against Goliath? You know the story. He comes against Goliath with just a slingshot, some stones. This great champion over nine feet tall. He takes down this giant, one stone, knocks him down runs to the giant, grabs his sword, finishes him off, and it was a great victory that day. And David, right away, was plunged into national limelight. The nation of Israel began to look at David as a hero. I mean, after all, after you defeat a giant, word gets around quick. That was before the internet, too, right? But here's the thing. David could not see his future. David was a prophet, priest, and king. He grew into those roles as time went on. And David could hear by the Spirit and get glimpses, just like anyone prophetically. We can get a glimpse of the future, but you do not know the future. How many of you are glad you don't know the future? <laughs> How many of you are glad you didn't know what was going to come the last five years in your life, right? Right? You see, it's God's mercy that he doesn't reveal everything to us. He'll give us glimpses in the spirit. We'll get a prophetic word or God will speak something to us out of his word. And we'll get an idea of what God has for us and where he's moving. But he does not tell you everything because if he told you everything, most of you would say, I'm out of here. It was better back in Egypt. At least we had leeks and onions. You remember the story? You see, and that would be the case for many of us. If we knew, uh, <laughs> when the Lord spoke to me over about a three-month period of time, and Pastor Carol and I were talking and sharing about planning this church, uh, one of the things God did during that time frame 15 years ago, he took me to a conference on the East Coast in Virginia Beach, Someone paid for the airline ticket. Carolyn said, go. Spent four days there with God in this conference. God speaking many things to me. And in the end of those four days, I knew it was the Lord. And I was afraid. Because planning a church isn't easy. And then the Lord spoke to me at the end of one of these sessions. And he said, I want you to go talk to that man over there. He's a pastor. He's a pastor. So I went and talked to him, and I'd already been in ministry, already ordained, and worked as a missionary pastor, as a youth pastor, and 
And I went and talked to this brother, and I said, you know, I don't know why, but I just feel the Holy Spirit wants me to talk to you for a minute. Are you a pastor? He said, yeah, I'm a pastor. And I said, I feel like the Lord wants me to talk to you. He's been talking to me this whole week about planning a church. And this is what the brother says to me. He goes, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he goes, he go, I mean, he, I'm serious. And I looked at him, I go, this is not the word I was looking for. He goes, you'll lose probably the first hundred people. They'll come and go as you plant this church. People are fickle at times. And he goes, but if it's God, God will, you know, grow this thing up and, you know, but just be faithful to what he shows you. And, you know, I look back 15 years and I'm like, if God had showed me everything that we had gone through for the last 15 years, I would have said, there's no way I'm going to do this. No way. Now, you need to know, I love you all. I love this, the people of Tucson. I love this city. I know we've been called here. It's almost like a missionary call. We got called here, established here. I know this is our place of ministry, our metron, our sphere of influence. And from here, we're going to impact nations, and we have impacted nations. And so I, I, I literally, sometimes I pinch myself. I'm like, God, I get to do this. Now, there have been times I've been just like, God, oh, just kill me now and get it over with. Just kill me. David, King David, had he known what God was about to do after his victory over the giant, oh my, I don't know if he would have been so exuberant. And that's what I want to focus on probably the next couple of weeks here. Training for reigning. You see, God never changes, but life does, doesn't it? People and friends change. Sometimes they come and go for the strangest reasons. Sometimes close friends in our life just all of a sudden, boom, they just drop off. Or they get offended about something and they're gone. You know, that, that happens. Job situations change. How many of you have ever had a job layoff? Just gone through something? That, that's perhaps one of the hardest things for people. All of a sudden, just a, a suddenly happens and you weren't expect jobs layoff. Uh, you know, or a loved one, an uh, illness or, or disease or something, or a car, a serious car accident. Things happen. God is always good. Remember that. God is always good, but life happens. Things happen. David was about to experience a depth of God that he had never known as a young man. David had victory and confidence over the lion and the bear. That skill set that he, now hear this, that skill set that he had gave him the confidence to go against the giant and take the giant down. But God, who knows the end from the beginning, and by the way, who anointed David through the prophet Samuel to be the next king of Israel, saw that young man's heart and said, this is a young man, this is a man. Not a young man. This is a man after my own heart. He saw the end intended for David, but he knew David needed a little more training before he was going to reign as king. David didn't see it. Nobody else recognized it. In fact, the crowds thought he was ready too. David had to learn how to trust God each day, and so do we. Matthew 6.34, we read at the offering. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Tr today's trouble is enough for today. Don't focus on the season that you're in, the prophetic glimpse that you have of the future, where you're headed. If you focus too much on the future, you'll lose sight of, number one, the joy of today. And number two, some of you may just be hanging on for dear life today. And if you focus too much on tomorrow, you're going to just be in turmoil today. That's what Jesus said. Every one of us in this room is in transition in one way or the other. We're all transitioning to something. We don't exactly know what it is. But I will say prophetically, the body of Christ is transitioning into a season that is going to be beyond anything the modern church has ever known. Where the presence of God and the miracles of God are going to just continue to increase and increase. And by the way, as that light and the radiance of his splendor on us and through us continues to shine and his glory increase, and the darkness increases, right? We're going to have like the best of times and yet the most challenging of times, right? And you got to recognize, keep your eyes on Jesus irrespective of everything else going on. It's going to be amazing what God is going to do and what he's already doing. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel 18. You guys doing all right? 
Don't worry, I'm going to give you lots of Bible. Probably going to have to break this up in a couple weeks here. 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, so David has just triumphed over Goliath. Saul is like, whose son is this? He's got his attention now. The soul of Jonathan, this is one of Saul's sons, was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. I'll come back to this in a minute. God gave David a best friend. You need a best friend in life. In fact, you probably need a couple or so best friends. I challenge the men here at the beginning of the year, if you don't have the phone number of another man or two in the church, besides a pastor or elder, you need to do that. Get a friend. Somebody you can call. Someone you can share your success with. Someone you can share prayer requests with. Someone that can be with you. Someone that you can grow in relationship with. And ladies, this applies to you as well. So that when you're going through a time, or again, it's just a success, you can rejoice together. Or go have some fun together, right? Jonathan's soul was knit to David, and he loved him as his own soul. Verse 2, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. He's been brought into the king's palace, but he's not ready to reign yet. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. This is a, understand Middle Eastern culture at that time. For a king's son to give another man his kingly wardrobe, his armor, his weapon, that's like, he was prophetically given David a sign, I know you're the next king. It should be, but no, no, I know God has his hand on you and it's you. And later as you read through the book of Samuel and the story of Jonathan and David, you'll see where David or Jonathan actually says those words to David that I know you're the next king of Israel. But here you begin to see it play out right at the very beginning as God begins to elevate David. So David went out, verse 5, wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. Everybody say, behave wisely. In some translations, it says, and prospered. I'll unpack that more in a minute. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Okay, so David, God has given him a victory over Goliath. David now has favor with Saul, and he's been given a position in the king's army. He has a best friend that God's given him, and now he's beginning to have favor with with Saul's servants and the people. Now it happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. He's been elevated in the eyes of the people. Then Saul was very angry And the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? In other words, Saul is afraid David will kill him and take rulership over the kingdom. So Saul eyed David from that day forward, and it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul An evil spirit came on Saul, possessed his anger, his jealousy, his fear, his, you know, phobia. All It just gave an entranceway for a demonic spirit, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear. That's what happens when someone is bent towards evil. And they're being demonically oppressed. He cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. This happened twice where Saul, you see in chapter 19 as well, he threw a spear at David, tried to kill him. Now Saul was afraid. The the root issue, Saul was afraid of David, verse 12, because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Again, David's been given a position 
a best friend, favor with the people. And by the way, he's given one more prize, if you will, one of Saul's daughters. Remember, Saul said, whoever kills the Philistine, I'll give one of my daughters in marriage. And we find in verse 27 of 1 Samuel 18, then Saul gave him, uh, Michal, his daughter, as a wife. She loved David. She loved him. And so it looks like everything's going good for David, right? David's behaving wisely. Let's, let's take a look at this. Verse 5, it says, David behaved wisely in front of the men that he was set over, Saul, the servants, and the people. Verse 14 echoes it. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord is with him. Again, that word could also be translated in English, prospered, and David prospered. But let's take a look at it. Proverbs 10.19 says this, He who restrains his lips is wise. That word wise comes from the Hebrew sakal, and it's the same word that's used for behave wisely or prosper in 1 Samuel 18.5 and 14. He who restrains his lips is wise. In other words, they use, it, they use their words with discretion. David behaved wisely and he prospered because he used his words wisely in front of a demonized king who was insanely jealous and wanted to kill him because he was afraid. And in front of Saul's servants, the people, David behaved wisely at a young age. Proverbs 21.11 says this, when the wise is instructed, same word, sakal, English we get instructed, is from sakal, he receives knowledge. You see, when you're behaving wisely, you're also teachable. One of the signs that someone's struggling with pride is they lose their ability to be teachable. It doesn't matter what our age is, we're all going to keep learning and growing in God's kingdom no matter how long we're on this planet. We have to remain teachable. you got to behave wisely, use your words with discretion, and be teachable. Because we're all being trained to reign. We're all transitioning from one season into another season. We've got to behave wisely outside the church, but also inside the church. Don't just say whatever words come to mind when you're upset to somebody. Proverbs 18.21, I mentioned about this last Wednesday night, by the way. If you weren't here, I encourage you to listen to that message. Many of you have never heard me teach on the power of prophetic proclamations and decree. I went over that last Wednesday night. It's on the website. But our words have power. Life and death are in the power of our words. But our words can build up or tear down. Our words can release heaven's atmosphere, or they can bring in the demonic strongholds, if you will. Saul's negativity... Anger, rage, and jealousy brought in demonic oppression. Now, sometimes, folks, it's just our flesh. We don't like something. And we feel we have the right to tell everybody we don't like something. I'm sorry, it's not really a democracy in the church, so to speak. And it's really quiet in here. I'm not going political on you. Let me just try to unpack this, okay? Okay. No, no, no. We, we misunderstand. God's desire is that we're all, Peter talks about this, 1 Peter 5, we're all submissive one to another. Younger, obey your elders, but elders also listen to your youngers. And Peter goes on to say, be submissive one to another. In other words, honor one another. Use discretion with your words. Use words that build up and pull out the best in somebody, not tear down. You're being trained to reign. You're being trained to move into greater positions of God's favor and his grace and his glory. How many of you want to see more miracles? Starts right here. We want to prosper? Use your words with discretion. But also, secondly, be teachable. Receive instruction. The minute that we stop learning and we think we've got it all figured out, uh-oh, religious spirit... Religious spirit thinks we got it all figured out. Listen, I, I'm not saying compromise the word or compromise the message, but I'm saying understand that, that in each generation, in each season as it unfolds, there's different modalities or methods on how we do things. Let's not be stuck in ruts. Let's be teachable. 
If we, kept, if we kept ministering to kids today like we used to minister to them 100 years ago, oh my gosh, they think we're abusive. Some of you got it. They were stern 100 years ago. I don't know if I could take it. All right, so methods change. And, and so we need to be open and understand. Let's be teachable. Now, David... He's been given, let's recap here. He's had a victory over Goliath. He's been given a best friend by God. He's been given a position in Saul's house. He's been given favor with the people. He's been given a lovely wife. Things are looking good for David. He's going out. He's leading his men. He's got victory. But there's one slight problem. You got a jealous, demonized king after you. Don't go looking at your boss tomorrow at work with, you know, suspicion. (laughs) David's being trained for something that he couldn't see. God wants to now take him deep. Am I saying every evil that began to happen to David was, was literally by the hand of God? No, I'm not saying that. But here's the thing about God. He will use every circumstance, even when it's an outright attack from the enemy through someone to try to destroy our life, God will still use it for his good and, so, and for our good so we'll become more and more like Jesus. It's painful at times. Let's jump over to 1 Samuel 21. Now, for time, I, I'm going to skip chapter 19 and 20. You can go back and read it. Basically, Saul is after David. Twice the spear thrown at him. He comes to, to, you know, just capture David, kill him. He escapes. Jonathan helps him. He comes at night to try to kill David when he's with his wife, Kale, and... <laughs> She hides an idol in the bed, puts goat goat hair or something on the idol, so the men come and think it's David in bed. Saul gets there. David's gone. And this is what she does. She says, he threatened he was going to kill me, so I had to let him go. She lied. And you know what? Their marriage was never the same after that. So Jonathan, you know, he wants to help David, but, I mean, he's got a raging father who's the king, who's ready to kill his best friend. And so Jonathan's got to back off. So all of a sudden, David's on the run. And he's running into the desert, and he's desperate. I mean, he's just had this amazing victory, and he's had favor with, with, with God, with the people. And a couple of years go by, and he's having these victories. And now all of a sudden, everything has come against him in his life. He's being trained to reign. He doesn't know what's happening. Some of you know what I'm talking about. He's on the run. David's lost his best friend. Did Jonathan's still in the picture, but he doesn't have that intimacy anymore. David's lost his position in Saul's army. He's running from Saul. By the way, the prophet Samuel that anointed David, David goes to Samuel and... (laughs) <laughs> there at the at Naoth, I, in verse, uh, you see it in chapter uh, 20, 21. And basically, David's got to leave Samuel. He loses the father figure, the prophet in his life. He's got to run from Samuel. Samuel gives him some good advice, but he's got to run. Everything that David was, he's already left his wife and his wife now is in deception because she's trying to protect herself as well. Everything that was close to David is being knocked out away from him. You could call them crutches, if you will. Not that David had any idols out of those things, but in the grand scheme of what God was doing in David's life, God allowed David to get to the place where he had nothing. Sound like Job? (laughs) Because God has a greater purpose in mind for David, and David doesn't realize it. Remember, David was behaving wisely. Now, as we pick this up in chapter 21, 1 Samuel 21, verse 10, this is David's about ready to bottom out. 
Then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Ashish, the king of Gath. Remember, Gath is where the Philistine Goliath was from. It's the enemy's stronghold. David's so desperate, he's gone back to the enemy's stronghold. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now David took these words to heart and was very much afraid of Ashes, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them, pretended madness in their hands, scratched on the doors of the gate, and let his saliva fall down his beard. This is our giant killer we talked about last week. You guys are pumped up. You're ready to go slay some giants, right? Now our giant killer is trying to pretend madness at the enemy's camp, stronghold, trying to get favor. And in Middle Eastern culture at that time, those that were considered insane were, were just disregarded in society. And basically, the king's like, I got enough madmen. Get him out of here. And David's so desperate, he's clawing. I mean, picture the scene in your mind. He's at the gate, and, and this, you know, right at the gate of the city, and he's clawing, blah, 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 you know, acting like a madman when, he, when, they, when he realized they all know who he is. That'd be like me going down to, you name the bar, and I'm wearing a baseball cap and sunglasses, and I'm sitting and I've pounded down about 12, and I'm, I'm pretending I'm just one of the guys, you know? And they're like, isn't that the pastor? That, you know, what's he? No, I'm just, I'm just here. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You tasted of the good things of the kingdom and your life with Jesus and all of a sudden you got into a hard spot and it was a lot easier to go back to your old way of life or go back to what you knew or where you thought you might get some relief. Come on, don't look at me so pious. I know some of your stories. Uh-oh. Everything that David was leaning on has been taken away. In the final blow, he loses self-respect. He pretends madness before the king of the Philistines. He can't lean on anyone or anything, only God. You see, you need that best friend, but don't let your best friend become an idol. You need your spouse, and you need to be partners and working together, bounce things off of one another, but you need to have God first. We need the comfort of the church. We need to pray for one another. Scripture tells us that. Bear one another's burdens. We need that. Community is life-giving. But we need to have our solace and our comfort because there are times that only God can give us the comfort that we need. Only God. Deuteronomy 33, 27 says this, The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. God is to be our strength. We trust his everlasting arms through all of life's situations. For some of you, you might be in a season where it seems like the crutches are being removed. When Carol and I, right after we got married, we made a decision we were going to go not just like 50% with Jesus, not 75%. We were going to go 110% with Jesus. It made some of our friends, some of the people we worked with, a little nervous and so many of them were Christians. They went to calmer churches. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we were part of this charismatic church there in Florida, and it's like us today, and just going for it. And, and we, we just radically changed quickly. And uh, we lost every friend we had, close friend we had. We had to make new friends in the new church culture that we were part of. Look back on it. I wouldn't have, I don't regret it for anything. It was the best decision we made to go after Jesus 110%. I mean, because after all, when the day is done, whether you live 100 years on this earth or whatever length of time God gives us, when the day is done, we're going to stand before him 
And he's the only one that matters. I, again, be loving and kind to others and work, all that. But, but some of the friends, you know what? God, God's trying to get you to let them go. Let go of the past. If they're not bringing you closer to Jesus, let them go. Love them, be kind to them, but let them go. Somebody else can minister to them. I've heard this so many times. Well, I, I feel like God wants me to minister. No, you're barely coming out of that situation that you've been in. You're not the one to minister to them. Someone else can minister to them that's stronger in the spirit, stronger in the Lord. You don't have to go sit in the bar with them. You don't have to go smoke some pot with them and think you're trying to relate with them. By the way, and you don't have to sit intellectually with them too and do the intellectual diatribes. We'll go, I'll go on both ends of the spectrum here. You don't have to you know, go through all of that and the religious rigmarole and all that stuff too. You know, just some of you need to get out of some of those situations because God's trying to deepen the well within you. You have a God-sized shape in your heart that's only for him. And he's trying to fill that with his love and his presence because he wants you to be a giant slayer. You're being trained to reign. We could turn this city upside down. Imagine just seeing... Miracles, cancer beginning to happen. People come to Christ left and right because everyone's just, boom, on fire with God. God's done what he, you know, deep well within us. Amazing. Don't allow that friend, spouse, wealth, position, or anything to take the place of God being your dwelling place. I'll just touch on this a little bit. I'm going to pick up next week. I'll keep you processing through the week here. Let's talk about the cave a minute, and I'll really unpack this next week. David's brought so low. Oh, I didn't finish uh, my reading there in 1 Samuel 21. So he's brought for the king, verse 15, 1 Samuel 21. I don't have need of this madman. Let him go. Now 1 Samuel 22. This is important. David, therefore, departed from there. He's got nowhere to go. The enemy won't even let him back in. You know you've hit rock bottom when the enemy doesn't want you in his camp. (laughs) David departs from there, escapes to the cave of Adullam. So when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who who was in debt, remember Saul had put heavy taxation on on the people on the land, And everyone who was discontented or bitter of soul, just gone through hardships because of Saul, just life, everything. The land wasn't prospering because you had a wicked king. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Now, we live in the desert, and our desert climate here in Tucson and Sonoran Desert is very close to what it's like over in Israel. We've been there three times. We've been to some of the caves. We've been to En Gedi. It's a great place there. Uh, near the Dead Sea. It's one of the places where David would go, the, and the caves of En Gedi. But En Gedi was, En Gedi's like the Hilton of caves. The cave of Adullam is like Motel 6. I have nothing against Motel 6, but it's just not like the Hilton. Are you with me? You have caves and then you have caves. At En Gedi, you have this beautiful waterfall. It's like water running and it's rolling down and the caves are right up there and they'd hang out in the caves and they had water and, and they, you know, they, they were close to Jerusalem and all that. But Adullam, if you look on the map, it's like in the desert and there's like nothing there. David has gone to like the most deserted place to this cave. And guess what? It does, the scripture doesn't say this, but I believe this because I've been there. <laughs> he wants to be alone. When you've hit rock bottom and you're acting crazy in front of other people, you've, none of you have ever done this, have you? You've never acted crazy. Not today anyways, yeah. Uh, you want to kind of be alone. You're trying to process what happened to me. It was going, we had such a great victory. And then all of a sudden, what, what happened? David's in the cave and all of a sudden all the other future cave dwellers How many of you want to raise your hand right now? (laughs) I think I'm out of the cave, but I don't know. I still have, I still have freestanding reservation. There's a cave over in Sabino Canyon. Anyways, anyways, uh, some of you got it. David is so desperate. He's in the cave 
And if you look at Psalm 142, Psalm 57, Psalm 34, in opposite order, we don't know when exactly they were written, but Psalm 57, Psalm 34 were written at this time of David's life. Psalm, most believe Psalm 142 as well. It looks as though David wrote Psalm 142 first when he got to the cave. And I'm just going to put one verse on. Go look at these psalms this week. Psalm 142, verse 6. And David says this. Do we got it? I'll read it. Verse 6, he says, I cried. uh, Well, verse 5, he says, I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Verse 6. Attend to my cry, for I'm brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Verse 7, bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. The righteous shall surround me, for you shall deal bountifully with me. David is overwhelmed. He says in verse 3, my spirit is overwhelmed within me, but you knew my path. David has hit rock bottom. It happened right after the victory. He's being trained for something else. But in verse 57, David's brought to his knees. He's beginning to get an understanding of what God's doing. Or Psalm 57. Then in Psalm 34, David begins to rise to his feet. And he begins to get into that place of victory. And begins, He's still in the wilderness. He's still in the cave years. But now his perspective. You see, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. I'm almost done for today, and I'll pick up next week. David was being refined in God's crucible. He was being trained to reign. A crucible is a vessel used to melt metals at a high temperature to remove the impurities. It's also a severe test or trial. Carolyn, I had a dear friend once. She's passed on now, and she said to us years ago when we first got started in ministry, we were going through a tough time, and she said, it's in the crucible that God determines if you're usable. It's in the crucible. When the fire is turned up, and you don't even know why it's turned up, will you behave wisely? Will you use discretion with your words? Will you be teachable? Or will you become angry, bitter, blame shift, angry at God, angry at others in the church? What about my mission? What about my calling? God said this. I know. Let him deal with you. We don't understand all God's ways. Sometimes, I I can remember going to certain pastors when I was younger and in different seasons of my life, some more trialsome and more severe than others, and looking, it's like if they could just give me a word. And sometimes, one pastor in particular, I remember, he's in his late 80s now, he looked at me and all, all he would just say, God's hand is in this. And as a pastor, sometimes I've learned over the years, that's, only, that's the best advice I can give some of you. I don't understand all the whys, but I know God's hand is in this. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. One last verse, and I'll pick up next week. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 and 13. You guys doing all right? I want you to really process this message this week, next couple of weeks. Peter said this. We talked a lot about Peter and month of February. He said, Beloved, do not be amazed and bewildered at the fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality. Remember what a crucible is, right? High temperature to remove the impurities. The fiery ordeal which is taking place to test your quality is though something strange, unusual and alien to you and your position were befalling you. Verse 13, but insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, rejoice so that when his glory full of radiance and splendor is revealed, you may also rejoice with triumph exultantly. You see, refinement is part of our Christian experience. God uses life and the circumstances of life to refine us for promotion. You're being trained to reign. It's just not coming exactly like what you'd wanted. Pressure is necessary, folks. For diamonds to be made. God's allowing it so we can get moved into. Now, I believe this church had been in a season, and I think we're actually on the other side of it, 
We'd been in a season where their fire and the pressure really came a couple years ago. And I believe we're on the other side of it. And what's beginning to happen is all of a sudden we're beginning to see, oh, this, is, this was a good end that God intended. Uh, are you with me? And I believe for some of you individually the same thing. Some of you are still, we're in different places in the process. Allow God to do it. So next week what I want to look at, I want to unpack this a little bit further. I want to look at how David used some key principles to really turn his life around and get his attitude in the right place. He had to learn how to surrender to God's will and God's way. He had to learn how to trust. He had to learn how to be obedient. That obedient is, obedience is key when you're in the cave. And he had to learn how to declare. Again, if you weren't here last Wednesday night, go back and listen to the message I gave this past Wednesday night on the power of, of praise and proclamation. I forget the exact title I used. But basically, learning how to declare, you begin to release what God's saying, even in the midst when it looks contrary, it begins to shift things. So, Father, I just pray. And one of the things I want to do, uh, I felt led to do today and then also next week. I want to pray for younger people who feel uh, called to some level of leadership, and I hope that's all of you. Age 35 and younger, I want to pray for those today. Next week, I want to pray for those 35 and older. So you older ones have to be a little patient this week. So those that are 35 and younger, this altar calls for you. We'll pray for the sick as well today. I feel there's, there's an anointing for healing. But I want to pray just for the... Because I know some of you are in that place. You're like young David. And it's like everything that I was... It's all changing in my life. Father, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, give us a holy tenacity to see what you're doing, what you're unveiling. David couldn't see it all. He had to learn how to surrender, trust, obey, and declare. Lord, help us get into that place. Well, when we don't understand it, we don't get into the negativity, but we stay strong in you. And so, Lord, I just pray, strengthen your people today. And I thank you, God, for the end that you intended in David's life and in our life. And I pray for these younger ones in particular. Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now, stir and activate. And if you don't know Jesus today, give your heart to him today. You'll never make it through the trials and storms of this life apart from his strength and his love. And he's made a way for us not only to succeed in this life, but to be restored to the Father. Give your life completely to him today.